Good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to a very first um, episode of Up the Slope, a wee special that we're going to persevere with over the next over the next few while. Uh, we're going to record these hopefully once every week or once every fortnight, and what we're planning to do is maybe get the listeners to vote on things that they want us to talk about, but just for the first episode, we thought we'd get it up and running and have a wee conversation about something which has been talked about quite a lot over the last sort of week or two, uh, and actually probably over the last season or two, owing to the talent that we seem to have in our academy and our development side at the moment at the club, uh, and that's about playing the youth players. So um, there's just a couple of us on tonight, not on a full house, but we'll plan to do this and more more going forward, where maybe there's just the two of us, so it's a bit more conversational, a wee bit more relaxed than still. Um, so I've got my my compadre, my partner in crime, G, with me this evening. G, how are you doing? Very well, thank you, Liam. How are you doing? Well, doing all right, thanks, mate. Doing all right. Um, hi, right, we're, 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 we're doing this one tonight just because I think probably me and G have seen the most of um, what is, I suppose, this season's development team, uh, the last season's under-19s uh, side, and, and, a, and a few of the under-18s on this side, this, this, this season's team as well. So we thought we would bring this special episode to you. And um, yeah, well, I think let's just kick us off and give everyone a wee bit of an introduction. So I think everyone listening will know that uh, we won the, the Youth Development League last season and as a result we've had some, uh, I suppose, relatively high-profile European games to play this season and they've performed really admirably in, in those ties. And uh, On the 7th of February we'll be playing Borussia Dortmund at Easter Road, so a big game. We, we hope you all get behind that and get down to support the boys because it's a really big occasion for, for the young men in their, in their bid to kind of get some European glory for the club, which would be really quite incredible. But what we want to talk about tonight is not so much the development squad itself, um, but actually what impact the development squad can potentially have on the first team. Um, so I guess first question to you then, Greg, in terms of the games that you've seen and the, the sort of uh, development players, who, who's really kind of stood out for you as, as potentially guys that might be ready for the first team? Um, I think Megua, 100%, with the physique. Um, I think he's very comfortable on the ball. He, he, he's hard in the tackle. Also, players like Oscar McIntyre, who, who's got bags of ability. <clears throat> and then you look, you look maybe out in the midfield with Murray Aiken, who, who's always been impressive when I've seen him. And then Josh O'Connor and Ethan Laidlaw up front. I think there's always a lot made about, about their pair. Um, in my opinion, I would say they were ready to, to be thrown in and make it to the point where we've not got a choice but to throw them in. Last season, you and I talked about this a wee bit, and we 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 I think <laughs> poured water quite a lot over um, people suggesting they should be thrown into the team last season. Yeah. Um, clearly, we were certainly the second half of the last season. We were underperforming, and we were we were lacking a centre forward really with Kevin this bit injured. What for you's kind of changed between this season and last season to make you think that some of those guys might be ready? Um, recruitment for one. We've not really recruited the right players. We recruited Kukarevich, obviously he's been out injured. But I think they've continued to score goals. I think was it Ethan Labour has got twenty goals in eighteen games or something. So that's a very impressive record at any level of the game. Um, and obviously Josh O'Connor keeps scoring goals too, and they two seem to have a really good partnership and, and link up well together. So I just think that that they're another year older, more mature wiser, probably a bit of physically as well. So I think it's at the point now where you need to try and allow that gap um, to be bridged and, and get the young lads into the first team. Because uh, we, we started the season with, I think, 26 first team players, which was a massive squad to carry, particularly when we were out the League Cup before the end of July, um, which in a lot of circumstances probably doesn't really allow for young players to get in. But I, mean, I looked at, a, I saw a tweet and I think, on, on the basis of a couple of sales that are still to happen today, it looks like we might have already managed to move on nine or ten of those players uh, just in this window alone. So reducing the first-team squad does create opportunities. And you mentioned a few different positions there that we're looking at. Another one that's um, another one that I think, I believe Murray Johnson's been training with the, the first-team a fair bit this season mm -hmm. and, and learning from David Marshall. So he's another one potentially for the future. But focusing on the guys that can maybe have an impact just now, defence, if you look at it, is a... Bit of a concern. Um, a little we've bit. Got, 
We've got a uh, Porteous by all accounts looks like he's going to be announced as a signing for Watford in the next day or two. Rocky Bashiri potentially a long term injury. We know that Paul Hanlon's been struggling with a, a conflicting reports, either a hip or a hamstring problem, um, depending on um, who you I have read, it, who you I have it on good authority um, from a, a source within his family that is a hamstring. Right. He needs to go to a specialist in London um, for that, so it's probably not wise that, that he plays. Um, which probably leaves Darren McGregor and Will Fish as only two centre halves. Mm. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it, it's it, it's it's not a great place for us to be in. I mean, we might see some movement in that in that space over the next couple of days. But just even the defence as a whole, you know, Stevenson's been drafted into play in midfield because of suspensions mm. and injuries. Um, at left back, Chabria really over the last sort of few months has looked a shadow of the player that I think we thought we'd signed at the beginning of the yeah. season. So certainly at centre back and left back there's some opportunities up opening up. And I know um, that Megwa, for instance, has played certainly on the right of a back three and potentially at right back. So so could potentially mm. be an option. Another one's Jacob Blaney. Um I don't know what you've made of Jacob Blaney when you've seen him play another again a centre half. I believe he's yeah. right sided as well. Is is he one who could potentially make a step up, do we think? He's always been solid. Look at that level. If if you're performing well week in week out, and then I think you probably deserve the opportunity to go and see see what it's like in the first team and, and maybe play some first team games. Obviously, we've let Jack Bryden go. Um, there seemed to be a lot of hype about him, um, so he's away. I think at this point, your hands are probably tied behind your back, and Jacob Blaney does need to be around the first team and and possibly getting minutes as well. Because he, he, he's one who's sort of been in and around the squads for quite a long time. And I think there's always that thing yeah. of that you get benefit from. I think he maybe came on in the League Cup as well, Blaney. And you, mm. you get benefit from kind of being in and around the squad without maybe actually getting the minutes. But sometimes, well, typically what you see with young players is <coughs> the time when they're actually thrown in and they're given an opportunity is usually because of injury. And, and quite often it's because of an injury crisis like the one that we've got at the minute. Um, so it'd be good to see potentially one of those two step in at centre back if needed. Um, particularly when you think about Will Fish, who he's only going to be at the club for another five months. What what benefit do we get from developing a nineteen year old to go back to playing Man United's reserves essentially, or yeah. not even reserves under twenty three team? Um, there's no really a huge amount of benefit to the club. Um, another one I wanted to chat about just in the defence as we move sort of along the defence into left back is Oscar McIntyre, um, who. I think Steve Keane is maybe not on record, but we certainly heard things about him saying that he believes he's maybe one of the most talented individuals in this group. You and I have seen him quite a few times now, um, yeah. either at left back or left wing back, and certainly going forward, um, looks to have the kind of tenacity and 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 the sort of drive to get up and down the line. And one thing I really was impressed by when I saw him was his touch. Um, for he, he seemed to be really really good in close control and in tight spaces. Would you chuck him in at left back with the options and what we've seen from Stevenson and Chabria so far this season? Um, <clears throat> I think you, I, I probably would, to be honest. I think at the moment, a young lad coming through who's hungry and wants minutes in the first team is a better option than Chabria because I think Chabria is a, I think his head's maybe gone. Um, so I think a young lad who's, who's hungry and wants to be involved in the first team, wants to play games, wants to achieve, wants to better himself, I think he'd be a better option than Chabria at the moment. Um, but I, I do like the fact that he is very tenacious. Obviously, we've seen him against uh, Newton Green Star. They're, they're grown men and he, was, he wasn't he was shy. He was battling and he was getting balls in the box. And he was taking players on. and He was just doing everything you want to see, really, in a, in a full-back slash wing-back. Oh, for sure, for sure, and I think the thing with with we'll left back as well, uh, a big part of it is 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 about the positions and the guys that are around you on the pitch, and actually, yeah. you can influence how I suppose how he performs by the players one playing inside them. So you'd maybe want someone with of experience playing at left centre back, but also the cover from in front, because one of the things I've noticed, especially over the last few weeks, in is um, sort of Stevenson's ability in a one on one seems to be. Fading, it's not something I really ever leveled yeah. a huge amount of criticism at Stevenson before playing at left back. Um, but he does seem to be kind of struggling against some of the more um 
skillful and, and and tricky wingers that you might you might come up against. Um, Chibraya, I, I don't I don't, don't want to touch too much on um, Sunday's performance or, or use that as kind of a, a yardstick because it's probably hard to judge mm. for, for for players. But didn't really do anything of note on Sunday in terms of in an attacking sense or in a defensive sense, yeah. did he? Just sort of went through the motions, I suppose. I think at left back, it's maybe slightly easier than the central positions to to sort of go through the motions and float through the game. I didn't really feel like it affected the game at all, where the younger players will look to go and affect the game. They've got, <clears throat> they've almost got that confidence, you know, of, well, I know that I'm going to go out here and try and impress and, and look to look to do all I can. Whereas when I feel like, Super at the moment, he's just sort of gliding. He, he's not affecting the team. He's not affecting the game or anything. So mm. I, I don't think he's, I don't think he's an option at the moment. Um, and if Stevens needs to play midfield, then somebody needs to come in at left back and, and fill that void. Yeah, it's an interesting one, McIntyre, because I think I think the opportunity is there to do very much what we did with Doig in terms of kind of bring yeah. him in to the team, give him those games. Um, mm. Albeit, you know, I think Doig had maybe played six or seven games on loan at Q, uh, 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 Queens Park. Queens Park, I say. Yeah. it was Queen Park. I played yeah. six or games, six or seven games at Queens Park before coming into the first team. I would quite like to see us do similar to what Jack Ross did with Doig in the, the COVID season, where he, you know, he was playing him, and then you know, if maybe form was kind of tipping off a little bit, he'd take him back out of the team, or maybe sub him the last sort of 15, 20 minutes of a game, and we were looking to see something out. Yeah. I would, I would like I would like to see us take that approach. I mean, it, it feels like I know he's still very young, but it feels like now is the time for for, for, for him. Um, because of yep. I suppose our frailties in that position, and this is obviously we're having this conversation. I guess on the understanding that we don't bring or sign anyone else between now and the end of the window to play left back. Yep. Yeah, suspect we probably won't, or if we do, it'll be kind of a short term sort of loan signing. So mm-hmm. now he feels at the time for McIntyre. I would be very much championing the cause of of getting him in the in the first team and getting him in the getting him involved as soon as possible. Really. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. definitely. Moving on, moving on to midfield then. So a name that you mentioned earlier on was Murray Aiken, who um, we were at the Player of the Year Awards last year. He won um, mm-hmm. kind of the Young Player of the Year, I suppose, for for, for the development side or the under-18 the under side last season. Um, mm-hmm. he, he did get off. He was one of those who came off the bench against St Johnston on the final day of the season. I think we were already sort of 4-0 up at that point. Um, but, but it was good to see. And actually, I think the fans got a real lift that day with some of the youngsters getting on. It was, I suppose, mm-hmm. it was quite a, it was quite a nice end to what had been a bit of a shit season, to be quite honest, bringing some of those young players on. What um, what do you think about Aiken's game, and what could he bring into the midfield that maybe we're sort of lacking in at the moment? I feel like the midfielders we've got are very one-dimensional at the moment. I think they're maybe very much the same as with Aiken's, maybe more of a driving forward with the ball and look to take players on. I feel like the midfielders we've got at the moment are very much... <clears throat> sideways passers, they'll maybe look to go back a lot where Murray Aiken's got got a lot of ability and, and travelling with the ball and, and going forward and picking out a pass. You know, I think that he he'd probably try and make that risky pass as well. Obviously against Rangers last year in the I can't remember the Youth Cup, you know, I felt like he was he was probably one of the players that was looking to sort of get in behind and play the ball in behind, almost play that that dangerous pass um, to open them up. So, so, so I similar to Scott Allen type, but obviously maybe not as, as well as distinguished, but certainly that sort of player where he will look to, to play through the lines. The, the versatility, I think, is something that we've kind of been lacking a wee bit in midfield. You look at... Um, you, I mean, we talk a lot about the importance of getting the combination right in midfield because there was a kind of long-standing Hibs myth around... It's maybe not even a myth, it's maybe completely fair about Newell and Doyle Hayes not being able to play in the same midfield because they were deemed kind of too too similar to play yeah. together, essentially. Um, yeah. It does feel like, and, and particularly on, on Sunday there, the game, and I hate harking back to it, but we did kind of go with sort of a very workman-like type midfield um, without maybe... Much ability... <clears throat> I mean, there's ability there, but it's it, it, it's 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 that real kind of like it's that sort of finesse, it's that quality, it's the mm. it's the 
straight threading through those difficult passes and be, and trying some of those difficult passes. Some of that's confidence as well, of course. And and mm. one thing we know about bringing young players into the team, sometimes they can come in and just instantly feed off the the the, the sort of support that they get and and demonstrate some real confidence. And others maybe maybe less so. Some some could be more fragile yeah. and kind of affected by the difficulties of the team. And that's kind of something I wanted to touch on with you because how difficult do you think it would be for some of these young guys coming into the team with the atmosphere that exists around the club at the moment? Because clearly supporters are pretty disappointed, to say the least, at how yeah. things have been going over the last few months. Yeah, I think that notoriously, pretty consistently, youth players have always got a bit more leeway. You know, Supporters want to see the young players come through. They'll give them a bit more time than maybe what they would with a more established first-team player. Um, and I feel like supporters won't get on the backs of the young players, whereas, for example, Joe Neal, you hear every week, boys are, are slating him. So I think they've almost got that buffer of they can sort of go out there and try and do anything really, and they won't get they won't get any a tough time for it really, which which is good. And obviously, I think. Maybe it'd be better if we could do that with the first team as well. But like you say, it's been a disappointing season. I think it's it's pretty pretty hard not to have a go at people, but the young players definitely get more leeway. And I think the other thing as well is that there's a lot of debate about the young team and if if they can make the step up and if they're good enough. But the only way you'll find out if they're good enough is if they're put in that situation. If you're put in a match situation, then you'll see if they're good enough or not. You know, I feel like a lot of people maybe <clears throat> without having watched a lot of them are like, nah, they're not good enough or ah, you can't do that to the young lads. But sink or swim really in, in professional football, I don't think don't think it's a bad thing to chuck them in. Yeah, no, no, I hear you. I hear you. And there, there might be the, the run of fixtures maybe post the Aberdeen game that allows that to happen. I think we've got a run of fixtures which I know we've been here before this season. We've said it already. Look winnable. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the difference between fixtures looking winnable and actually winning them have been two very different things this season because we have had runs where we've played pretty much bottom six sides for five or six games in a row and failed and failed to win any of those games. So I think we need to be we need to be cautious around talking about games being winnable, but I think it's a kinder fixture list than perhaps throwing them into yeah. two derbies, a trip to Ibrox and playing Celtic at home. Um so 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 fingers crossed, fingers crossed some of those guys get the opportunity. Listen, I just really want to quickly move on and talk about the forwards because I'm conscious that the yeah. two names that are probably most uh, most well known and maybe most synonymous with Hibs fans and, and, and Hibs Twitter mm-hmm. are, are um, Ethan Laidlaw and Josh O'Connor who um, you know Josh O'Connor um, be, 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 being I think the slightly older of the two and, and, and obviously yeah. the fact that you know the family name that kind of come, comes with him <laughs> um, is maybe the one that you know fans really kind of recognise and he made his debut uh, up at Pataudry last season I think he Suffered an injury, sort of second half of last season, which um, yep. saw him kind of miss out a fair bit. He's been, I suppose, playing and getting minutes for the, the development side. At the beginning of the season, were you surprised to see neither of those two go out on loan to try and get some first team experience? A little bit, because uh, you can keep on the development team if you want, but then we've not. There's not been a lot of development team games against clubs for down south, like we were told. Um, I think uh, even a League One team in Scotland, just to get them used to almost the physicality and, and the way the way of it. But I guess well, maybe Lee Johnson was hoping to have them more involved and it's just not happened. But I don't know, I feel like you're maybe almost stopping their development by not sending them out alone and getting them involved in, in match situations that play difficult pitches and against physical opponents, but for the outside looking at it, definitely one move would have been the preferred choice for the two of them. Uh, I mean, that's been the thing, isn't it? The development team just haven't played with enough frequency really to kind of make yeah. judgment on them this season. They've yeah. kind of relied on these European fixtures and then the odd sort of like reserve cup game or reserve league game and the, the games programme, as we understand it, fell through as a result of... Um, 
a change of personnel at the club um, yeah. and, and there hasn't been a, a, a games programme which I think will be a disappointment to a lot of the young players and I suppose their families as well who would have been maybe hoping Absolutely. to see them make, make some appearances. Um, Laidlaw's um, goal record, you touched on it actually at the, at the mm-hmm. start, is, is is the number of goals scored this season would suggest that he's kind of certainly banging form at the level he's playing mm-hmm. at. The, the worry that some fans might have is that both him and Josh O'Connor are out of contract at the end of the season. We understand that, that there's maybe still some negotiating there to be done, but given, the, I suppose, the hype and interest that surrounded these two players, how disappointing would it be to see both of them leave potentially at the end of the season without having really impacted the first team? Incredibly disappointing. Um Regard, as I say, regardless of what level you play, if you're scoring 20 goals in 18 games, and you're a good striker. Mm. And obviously, we, you hear things about the contracts and maybe not being offered as much as, as what they would have wanted or whatever. But I think it's always that what if they stayed and what if they got more of a chance? And there's so many questions that you could ask. But from what we hear, there's clubs swirling already, um, looking at the pair of them, so I just really need to sort it out, get, get them tied down. To lose them too would be a huge blow, because I don't really think there's anyone else in the forward areas really coming through at this point in time. And that's what fans want to see. Fans always want to see you know youth players coming out in the first team and, and making an impact and, and, and scoring goals for the team or whatever, but without really making an effort or, or an impact, sorry, would would be devastating and be really, really poor for the club, if I'm honest. It's that, it's that position as well that excites fans. We had, uh, certainly for me, like growing up, we had a conveyor belt yeah. of centre-forwards that we produced. I mean, Kenny Miller was the first and then there was a long mm-hmm. line after him, O'Connor, Rard and Fletcher. I know he didn't uh, go on to play as a kind of number nine later on his career, but Scott Brown as well. And we've, we've, we have had a history, and even in more mm-hmm. recent years, we have produced young players who've maybe not gone on to have a career at Hibs, but have gone on to do, I suppose, pretty pretty, pretty, pretty good things, I suppose, in, mm-hmm. in terms of football overall, in that sort of number nine position. It's the one position that really captures people's imagination as well. Mm-hmm. And we're recording at a time where we're expecting very, very soon for Kevin mm. Nisbet to be announced uh, as yep. going. Um, we've got a gap. We've got a space opened up in the first team. We've just let Bojan go. We've let Melkerson go. We are in dire need of a centre-forward. I'm going to put you yep. on the spot. Um, okay. Right? You, 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 you've, you've, you've got to choose between one of the two to be your main okay. number nine from now until the end of the season based on what you've seen of the two players that have played. Which one of the two are you picking? That's a tough one. <laughs> Both have different qualities. I'd probably say Laidlaw if it was one of the two to, to play up front. I would pick Laidlaw. That's not saying that Josh O'Connor is not, not a good football player, but I'd probably, I've, I've, I just think Laidlaw's maybe got that little bit extra. If, if we had uh, if we had Mike Bassett, Ryan Melville on, he'd be going four four fucking two and playing both of them, wouldn't he? Correct. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. It's a tough question because look, if the pair of them score goals, they've got different attributes, different strengths, maybe different weaknesses as well. But I just feel like Keith and Laidlaw's will be more that first team ready, which makes it all the more strange that Josh O'Connor's had a. Not really a chance, but he's had appearances and and, uh, and Laidlaw's not. I wonder if that's just an age thing with with Laidlaw still being. Yeah. The, I think he's maybe still seventeen. Um, uh-huh. and, and 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 also and also I wonder, you know, just 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 with the two of them, you know, there's, there's probably space for both of them. With Nisbet yeah. goes this week, really. I mean, there's probably yeah. space for both of them to be on the bench. I would far rather, if you now in the end of the season, us deploy the tactic of putting the young players in the match day squad and yeah. giving them minutes, than us. Going and sign a hell of a lone load of players, players on loan. Yeah. I just loan players just don't really capture like basically you're you're basically developing someone else's player uh, for a period of time where we could develop our own players in that in that space and time. So for me I I wouldn't want to see a striker coming on loan 
to be totally honest, I'd rather see the young lads get, get an opportunity. Kukarevic has been probably the one exception, I would say. I think he's been good. And unfortunately, her injuries have sort of um, kind of ruled him out, out over the last couple of months. I think we've actually really missed him. It's been a shame that we never really got to see him play up top in his bit in a two. I think that would have been quite good um, as a partnership. But we are in a place now, I suppose, where you know this is what we're kind of looking at. We're looking at potentially loans to fill out the first team squad. I think you and I are both advocates for for playing the young fans, the young the young players. I think yeah. most fans are. Yeah. There's an element of uncertainty that comes with that, but there's an element of excitement that comes with it too. So, um, hopefully, we see some of these young young guys get um get get a bit more of a chance. Um, yeah. So I mentioned at the start, I'll just mention it again. We do have that game against Dortmund coming up on the 7th of February, Easter Roads. We'd encourage you to get down. Um, we, as many of us will be there as, as possible. Um, yep. And uh, we really look forward to really look forward to, to that game. Um, we just want to quickly touch on it. We've got just a wee bit of time left. So we just want to touch on um, a couple of things, actually. Um, but that, as we've alluded to on the show already, so uh, Dimitri Mitchell has been confirmed. He's left. He's gone to... Exeter City for an undisclosed fee on an 18 month deal. Um, Greg, is that one that in any way surprises you? Or are you, and I suppose as a supplementary question to that, are you quite happy to see him go? Uh, I'd like to see him go. The, um, but I think he's a bit petulant, a bit of a child. Um, I think it was before the Celtic game he started putting stuff on Instagram and his behaviour. And then it ended up on the bench anyway. Um, he didn't really affect anything really I think what was it he scored scored in his debut and, and scored against Arbroath in the cup and that was pretty much it I think the home game against Ross County um, really sealed his fate I think what did he get 38 minutes or something um, <laughs> Tells its own story, and apparently it was because his missus had a baby two nights before or something. Once, yeah, once, yeah. As a famous, yeah. famous Roy Keane, <laughs> the serial winner, once said, but he wasn't giving birth, was he? So, and um, unless he's breastfeeding, he should be fit. So, yeah, I mean, aye, he probably would. Yeah, I think, he, I that, think he's a, sure. I think, uh. He's a very bad individual and not something you really want at the football club. No, so. no. I've not seen a huge number of tears for him leaving. Um, there's a couple of other bits of news which, which um, are, as, as we record, and it's 10 to 6 uh, on Thursday night, have not been confirmed yet, but we do understand that uh, Ryan Porteous is away to Watford for a fee believed to be around £500,000. Um Hopefully, albeit I don't think we've seen any indication of it yet. Hopefully, a sell-on involved in that for the club as well. Uh, there is a point? sell-on percentage. I'm not. Okay. I'm not sure what it is, but there is a sell okay. percentage. I mean, five hundred k. We knew. We knew whatever fee we were going to get mm-hmm. from right was going to be pretty small, but yeah. potentially sort of two or three placings in the league. Does yeah. it feel to you like the right thing to do right now to let him go, Kevin? The injury problems we've talked about, or is there just a, a sense of inevitability about it and it had to happen? I think there's a sense of inevitability. Look, before we had this injury crisis, clubs were, were looking at them. I think it comes back to the people running the football club have, have been miles off what we need them to be. Good luck to the boy. You know, he's never... He's maybe, look, he's had maybe his bad games, but you can never fault fault the laddie's determination or, or passion or commitment to the football club. Unlike the other player who, who's leaving, um, who, who threw his toys at the pram, but Porteous hasn't done that, and he's been a he's been a good good servant to the club. So he goes from goes with our best wishes, and I guess what will happen is he'll go to Watford and he'll end up at Udinese at some point. Um, yeah. But I'd I'd like to see him come back at, the, at some point as well. Aye, me too. I think you think probably it's fair to say you and I are probably is two biggest fans on the pod. Um, just 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 in terms of the kind of player he is and that sort of slightly more sort of abrasive yeah. style centre half, but he can play a bit too. And I think that's something that we can both appreciate. Look, I think he'll go on and do really great things. Um, from from this point sure. onwards in his career, I think I think. Uh, he, 
he, he's you know he's he's a he's a Hibs fan. He, uh, you, you know, has attracted a lot of I think very unnecessary and unwarranted mm. and negative media attention this time up here. I've said that a number of occasions. I actually think that I actually think that he'll really suit playing football on the continent if that's what he decides to do. I think he'll I think he'll do really really well uh, in 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 uh, Serie A or, or or really kind of any of the European leagues. To be honest, um, he, he's he's a he's a cultured enough footballer. I'm sure to be able to, to to hack it out there. So best of luck to him if that indeed does go through. Um, obviously leaves us with a bit of a gap that we're sad about, but you know. And then the the other one, just finally, just to touch on, and you've alluded to it already, but Kevin is, but looks like he's. Away to uh, Millwall of all places uh, for two 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 point four million by the sounds of things. Yeah. Um, Poor. I know yeah. I noticed the friend of the show, Tam McManus, was uh, said it was a good bit of business. I'd like I'd like to see like him to explain what part of that was a good bit of business. Friend of the so show. I think, <laughs> so I think was it? We get one point. We'll get one point four. Up front, obviously, Dunfermline will get their cuts. We'll be left with one point four up front, and then whatever the the other percentages are made up of, I don't know. But yeah, uh, just it, it beggars belief. But to be fair, he's the sort of player that, as soon as he knew, as soon as speculation starts about him, I feel like he maybe his head turns straight away. Stills. Yeah, yeah, we've seen it with Birmingham City when they came in, they threw his toys at the pram there, and then he was away to Millwall. So, yeah, good luck to him. But I don't really think that's a that's a great move, if I'm honest. I think that it's not really a glamorous move for him. Like London's by all right, but Millwall, I think he maybe could have done better than Millwall, but. They're going, they're going well in the championship this season, Millwall. They're, 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 they're eighth, um, mm-hmm. so they're sort of. I suppose they're in. They're in the sort of mix for the playoff places, but they're, they yeah. are. I mean, they're, they're a club who have traditionally sort of been in the lower half of the championship uh, down mm-hmm. in England. That have I've never really in, in recent times anyway sort of flirted with with, with promotion potentially. Um, no. I, I, I'm I'm kind of with you in in some respects. I'm 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 not convinced it's a it's a, it's a great move. Um, Certainly, in terms of career, I'm sure financially it's a big move for the boy. Um, I'm yeah. sure that they'll considerably up his his current salary. Um, yeah. And to be honest, I, 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 my, my, my sense is that Kevin is, but will probably go and score goals at, at that level. He strikes me as the kind of player yeah. who who will who will score goals, um, yeah. who will probably keep himself in the Scotland squad. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't wish him any any ill will, but it's a one, no. it's a, it's it's another one of those ones where I'm just a bit like a bit underwhelmed with, I think the overall business and the timing of it, and the decision to leave, and I think goals in a relegation battle of any kind are so important, and we've just given up yeah. essentially seven goals since the end of the World Cup. And yeah. at the minute. There's not any whispers about anyone coming to replace him, which worries me. Yeah. It is a worry, but... Yeah, a manager says yes to players that maybe aren't good enough, so... It's probably not a bad thing, to be fair. Maybe we better just stick in what we've got, get the young lads in, see what they can do. They'll probably be... I'd imagine they'd be hungrier than a loan signing for six months or whatever. Or a, or a little Chelsea friend who, who, I don't know, either needs more game time or, or needs to go. It's it's really one of the two. Aye. Well, right now, as the options stand uh, for Saturday, you've got an option to play. I, I mean, I don't even know who I recognise centre-forwards at this point. Recall Deutsch? Yeah. Nope. I'd rather play with no striker than play with Dodge. <laughs> Runs like he's wearing steel toe cap boots and a and a puddle of treacle, so yeah, he's, yeah. he's not he's not the answer. Although I think Harry put on Hibs dot net, play him centre half. Because <laughs> we know his credentials for defending Harry's corners. Yeah, well, that was hundred percent Harry. The other option, of course, is another Harry, and that's Harry McCurdy. Um, we'd expect him to make his. We'd expect him to make his sort of first bow as a number nine at the weekend, because there is literally 
uh, other than the young players that we've spoken about, he, he he kind of is the option. He's only really kind of come on and played wide, so not the most promising. Anyway, we're about to run out of time because Greg's got a game of fives to get to and I've got dinner to make. Um, so we hope you enjoyed this uh, really, really short episode that we're, we're, we've put out. Um, like I said, we will be asking you for a bit of feedback and we'll be asking you to suggest things that, that you want us to talk about. Um, do let us know what you thought. Um, do get in touch and uh, yeah, see you soon and hopefully we can uh, get back to winning ways on Saturday. Fingers crossed. See you later. Take care.